So welcome to my talk about creative leadership. I'm Lena, and I work as a senior service designer at DesignIt. I want to share my research insights today with you around the key qualities that foster awesome creative teams. And I wanted to start off by telling you how it all began. So my passion to understand creative leadership basically started because I was dropped in the deep end. I was given a project, and I was given a team, and I was asked to take the leadership role. And I quickly had to change my behavior and had very little guidance. I had to learn new soft skills to manage a team. I had to deal with hard feedback sessions. And I had to learn to talk more and do less. I learned it was no longer about my own creativity and sitting at my desk. It was about being more present for my team. I had to serve my team. And I had to create a right environment for them to do really good work. Um, it was hard, and I felt really, really lonely. Um, but when I talked to friends, I talked to colleagues, and I realized they find this quite hard themselves. And the idea is that actually, as designers, we're so passionate about what we do, but we're not always prepared for the leadership role we find ourselves in. So I wanted to help. I wanted to do research to understand what teams want from their creative leaders, because I thought, if I can understand what people want, I can become better. But also, I was hoping that I can guide other people that were in my situation and transition from doing the work to actually leading teams and projects. So what I did is I tapped into the Design It in Vipro's global network. And I spoke to over 40 different designers, talked to researchers, I talked to tech professions. I even talked to people that recruit myself and, and others in this industry, and specifically for Design It. And I got a lot of opinions. People are really passionate about this subject. Um, it was hard first when I started to synthesize all the insights, but after a while I started to see a pattern. Even if people were saying different things, they were kind of meaning similar kind of qualities. So it ended up being 10 qualities. That is the research result from this, this piece of work. And what I like about these 10 qualities that creative leaders need to have is the fact that they're not deeply rooted characteristics that people get from birth, such as like intelligent, being introvert, or being extrovert. These are actually qualities that is under your control. And you can change your behavior if you want to become better. And these 10 qualities come under this idea that as a creative leader, or as a we, you can use these uh, 10 qualities to deliver creative leadership as a service. And the idea is that you can play these qualities off for different situations and circumstances to create the right environment for your team. And it's about serving your team. This idea about serving your team has been spoken about before. It's loads of thought leaders out there. Um, it's a book about being a servant leader. It's um, people talking about the leader should be the immune system for the teams. And it's also the fact that they're talking about leading from the backs rather than leading, leading from the front. And all of this comes together under this idea of de more democratic leadership style. And I'm not surprised that when I talk to, to people in teams that that is the leadership style they prefer. Because it allows them to think and it allows them to be part of making decisions, even if the leader might have the final say. So going back to the research results. So this is the framework. The idea is that you can deliver creative leadership as a service, and you have to play off the 10 qualities depending on the circumstances. Um, the idea is that you will have to move between these qualities depending on your team's need. But the idea is that if, if you do so, you will be able to create the right environment for your team to be productive or be creative. I'm going to zoom into the qualities now, and I want to give you a more detailed understanding of some of the findings. And hopefully, you get some tips that you can start using today. So what I did is I looked at the 10 qualities, and I grouped them into four themes based on what they can help you achieve. I know that um, leadership is complex, and depending on what lens you apply, you can look at them in very different ways. Uh, which means you can group them in many different ways. But today, please bear with me, it's four themes. And I'm going to start from the top. So the first theme is the foundation. There is the basic quality you need to be a good creative leader, which is about being efficient communication to enable change. 
And the idea is that as a leader, you need to now learn to talk about delivering design, not just doing design. And if you can't efficiently communicate with your team or with your client or stakeholders, it's really hard to lead. Therefore, you need to have gravitas and persuasion skills to be able to convince people to follow your ideas, to align uh, people, but also be able to remove frictions if needed. You also need to be a proactive communicator. Um, it was some research stories about people having bad experience of leaders that had freedom to disclose information but still choose to hoard their information and keep stuff secretive to boost their own power. And that's not good because people will see that you're not a team player. They can also feel that they always have to come to you for help and it doesn't feel right. So be proactive communicator and share information generously so your team are empowered to make decisions even when you're not there. So that's the first quality and that's part of the foundation. And uh, the next three qualities I'm gonna take you through will help you get followers. Because as a leader, you need followers. If you're a manager, you might be just be given a team and you dictate what they do. But in design, you want them to want to follow you. The first quality is about demonstrate expertise to build trust. And that's the whole idea. As a new leader or in a new role, people will test your credibility. For example, if you start a new project, um, your team might ask really hard questions to see if you understand what they do. And if you can't give them sound answers, it's really hard for them to trust you. So one idea is that you can show work examples to show that you added value in previous projects, pre previous places you worked. Um, because then they can see that you have the right experience to be a good leader for them. They can see how they can learn from you um, and it's really important. The thing about testing your credibility can sound a bit mean, and people can feel like, why, why do people have to do this? But actually, innovation can be kind of challenging at, at times. So if the leader can't understand creativity and shape it with the, the people that they work with, it's going to be really hard when it comes to a client or maybe a senior person asking, why do we have to spend three weeks on research or five weeks on research if the leader doesn't understand why? If they can't fight for it as well. And that is your role as a leader to be able to, to convince someone that we need to invest three weeks in research. And if they're still really pushing, you have the understanding and how you can make the, the timeline a bit shorter without losing the core of what you're trying to do. The next one is about being visionary to inspire your followers. So as a leader, you need to set directions. It's about building a vision, and it's about creating a purpose that will align your team or your followers, but also makes them super excited to want to do something. And I'm not saying that you should be super prescriptive, the solution, because that's not the purpose. The purpose is to have a direction and say why you want to move in that direction. Then you can get the team to figure out how. It's really good because then they feel part of shaping it with you. And I feel like a leader, you need to be committed to the direction you choose. And you need to take risk to explore it. So that means that if you decide you want to be really successful in finance, you need to invest in exploring that direction and you need to make sure that you have resources in the companies working towards kind of releasing that vision. Another bit that you can do to help yourself being more visionary is about stay on top of trends and share inspiration. So that's around, hopefully you're passionate about something, you read articles about it. Make sure you share this with your colleagues because that shows that you're constantly learning and it makes them feel like they also need to constantly learn. And then an easy one, I think, regardless if you're a leader or just a team player, is about having points of views. So if it's a meeting, have point of views. If it's about a discussion around a specific subject, have point of views, because people will then realize that you have opinions and they will come for you for advice. Okay. So this is about the last one in getting followers. It's about having positive attitude to see opportunities in what we do. I was really surprised when I did the research that this is one of the qualities that came out the strongest. And um, 
It just seems that people really want to follow someone that has a positive outlook on, on life and work. And um, when I looked into it in more detail, actually, as a leader, you're responsible of the productivity level, which means that you constantly have to motivate your team to do more and be better. And that's when the attitude is really important. You need to be positive. And if the leader doesn't care, if the leader is really negative, why should the team care? So it's really important, even if you can't control every situation and the outcome of everything, you can control how you deal with it. So it's about being positive because it's contagious, but also it's about being authentic. I'm not saying about being this ridiculous positive person about everything. It's about having, we, we talked about at work, you're saying about being realistically positive with a flower of passion. Um, and then the last bit is about reframe to find the positive angle. So I know sometimes you get a project that has a really boring subject, but as a leader, you can find a way of finding something positive about it. Is it about um, maybe letting someone in your team to run a workshop which they've never done before, so it's an opportunity for them to develop? So you can't change the subject, but you can do something with the project to make it to something positive for your team. So these are the three qualities that will get your followers. It's about demonstrate expertise, because that will build trust. It's about being visionary and set inspiring directions for your followers. And then it's about having a positive attitude when doing work, because it will make people want to join the ride. So when you've got your followers, then it's about creating the optimal environment for innovation. You have to play off three new qualities. This is about setting clear expectation to create autonomy. So it can be hard to let go of doing the work because I find that, that myself. And it's really hard to understand how do I brief my team to make sure that they do work for me now. Um, so it's really important that you set clear goals and constraints. And that means sitting down with your team to talk about what is the goals for a project, what's the time frame, what's the budget, and what's the priorities. And then it's also about telling them or demonstrating to them what is the level of quality that you expect from them. You can be showing them some example of deliverables that you really like, but it's not about saying this is exactly what I want from you, because then it's actually really good to set clear roles and responsibilities so you have a subject expert, a UX person or a service designer, and you let them free to decide how they want to pr approach something and deliver it. Um, you, of course, as a leader, can question and you can have conversations with them, but let them have ownership of what they do. And then a really core cool thing that came out of the research is about leading by example. So show that you're a team player and don't ask people to do stuff that you wouldn't want to do yourself. So don't ask people to come in early if you're not prepared to come in early. And don't ask people to do stuff that you're not wanting to do. So maybe give them the boring task you, you don't want to touch. People will notice that and don't do it. The next one is about embracing failure to enable experimentation and push boundaries. So if people can't fail from time to time, you're never going to come up with something amazing. If you read about Google and their performance, the, that most high-performance team are the ones that feel safe to share ideas and thoughts and without having a consequence of losing their job or feeling like it will reflect badly on them as a person. So if you're a leader to kill ideas, you're only comfortable to do stuff the way you've always done, you're going to create a glass ceiling for your company. They will not develop. But it also means that all those talented individuals that want to improve everything they touch will feel really frustrated. They will stay on for a bit and will learn, but then they will move on because they don't feel like they get a platform where they can be creative. So if you want to create this um, culture of um, experimentation, you need to share mistakes and talk about what you learn from those mistakes. It's so simple as, as a leader, myself, you, you have to talk about the mistakes you've done and say, I didn't get fired from it. My colleagues have done mistakes in these projects. They did not get fired. But it's about talking about what they learned from them because you do need to manage risk and you need to make sure that you learn from those mistakes so you don't repeat them over and over again. And then it's about share and build on each other's ideas. So... You need to make sure that people are happy and feel safe to share ideas that are not that massaged and packaged up. And as a leader, that can be about sharing your ideas, but then be quiet. 
or encourage other people to add to your ideas. In design it, we're very keen on never saying no but, but instead when someone proposing something, say yes and, and you build on each other's ideas. Um, in the beginning, yeah, it can be quite a bad idea coming out, but when you build on it, you might be able to come up with something that's brilliant, or later on you park it, but it's, a, it's about allowing yourself to experiment and at least try it for a little bit and not just kill everything. And then it's about picking your battles as a leader. So the thing is, if you're going to experiment, I know as a leader, sometimes you sit with your budget, you don't have time to experiment, but you need to figure out or find a way to create a platform where sometimes you can go along with stuff that you might not support. So if uh, your team, for example, ask about approaching a project in a whole new way that you not actually think going to work, Sometimes you need to let them try because you might be surprised how well it goes. Or if they fail, they will fail quickly and they will try again and they will learn from it. Um, but it's not about being sloppy. It's about having considerate experiments and be accountable for it. And then the last one that will create an optimal environment for innovation is about embracing diversity. I heard some people talking about this today. And it's about creating something better together. And it's the idea that the more diverse the opinions are that contribute to the work, the better the idea will be. And I've had stories in my career where you're asked to create this blue sky thinking in the new concept. And as a design team, you sit together for weeks and you deliver it to a client. And the concept cannot be implemented because the business expert hasn't contributed to it or the developer has not contributed to it. And it's a waste of time if you can't implement your concept. So it's about diverse, uh, diversify your team in the sense of you need to understand the experts and you need to become this master chess player that can draw in the expert when needed. So it's not about having a team of 40 different experts in a room. You can still stay as a design team, but you need to know when to bring in a developer to assess what concepts you're going to take forward. And part of that is that you need to facilitate collaboration as a leader. So when now when different backgrounds and discipline comes together to have conversations, you need to be able to, to still lead them forwards and leading them towards the solution. So that's the three qualities you need to play off to create an optimal environment for innovation. It's about set clear expectation to empower the team. It's about make them feel safe to share ideas and allow them to experiment in considerate ways. And then it's about diversify your team to deliver more to market faster. Then to the last three qualities, which will help you have a more productive team. It's about be humble to build relationships with your team. So we have had stories from the research talking about leaders that just talk, 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 and they don't listen to people's input and ideas. And the thing is that people get really frustrated. The team doesn't feel motivated because they're not contributing to the work they do. Um, and the productivity level will go down. So don't do that. Show you care about your team and respect them and get to know them because then you understand their superpowers. Demonstrate respect by being approachable to say simple things, say good morning to them in the morning. Uh, it's about being honest. So if you do a mistake, say you're sorry. And don't do false promises like saying that you're going to come by at 2 o'clock or you're going to give them these documents and then you never give it to them because they constantly then get frustrated and then they're trying to figure out your alternative motive and if you're actually going to do what you said you're going to do. And then it's really about being um, a have a learner mindset, which means about being curious and understand that you don't know everything and be grateful for other people in your team and your company that know other stuff that you don't. And be curious to go out and ask them for things, go, be curious to fin find out more and learn, and then be an active listener. I know it can be hard for some leaders when you s occupy with so many things to do, but if you're not actively listening to your team and giving them the time that they deserve, they're not going to be committed. There's some stats talking about if the um, employees feel like you care for them and you're committed to them, you get more commitment back from them. And then it's, it's about support your team to do their work, which is one of the qualities. Um, it's been baked in with a few different things that have been said in the research here. And one of the key things that teams hate is micromanagement. And it can be so hard when you're going from doing to leading because you're so used to be close to the work. 
but you need to realize you can't control everything anymore. And even if you're so tempted to step in and do the work for your team, they will not learn anything. And they just feel like you don't trust them. So it's important you st uh, step away and give up control. And actually only s check in with them rather than trying to do the work for them. Check in to, on them to see that they are doing well, but also make sure you zoom in and out of um, the details. So if you're giving them clear expectation, you know what kind of level of quality you want the deliverable to be. So if they say, I'm working on a concept, check in on them, see what they're working on, and see if they're going in the right direction, see if they deliver to the quality you expect. Otherwise, you might have to just navigate and help them out a little bit. And then stay calm and remove obstacles, which I think is the key one for supporting your team. It's around when you check in on your team, make sure that you see if there's something hindering them, try to remove those obstacles. So that's such um, things like, if it's too many meetings, they never have time to be productive. Make sure you remove some of those meetings. If they're not having enough resources on the team, see if you can get some more people to help them out. And then the last one is about coach your team to create a well-functioning team that enable growth. Um, this is all around the fact that as many designers, we're really nice, we're really encouraging because that's really good to um, make creativity blossom. But when you become a leader, you need to become this more critical person because you're responsible for the creative output. And it can be really hard, but you need to have this emotional intelligence of understanding the team dynamic and if people are doing what they should do. And then you need to learn to give constructive feedback to make sure that you kind of manage the team. So if someone is not pulling their weight, you need to in a constructive way tell them off to make sure they kind of fit in the, fit in the line. And then the best thing to get people to do what you want them to do is about recognize effort. And that's about just celebrate, say verbally in a Monday morning meeting that this person has been really great. Or if people don't feel comfortable with that, just go up to them and say you're really proud of what they did. And then it's about pushing boundaries. And that's about if you've been humble enough to get to know your team, you know their superpowers. They appreciate if you say that you believe in them. And then because you know them, you know how you can push them. So someone that had never done, I talked about before, had done a workshop, if you think they're ready or almost ready, tell them that they should run it next time and then be there to support them when needed. And when they accomplish something like that, they will be really proud of themselves. And it means that you constantly getting a little bit more of your, from your team. So that's the last uh, three. And uh, if you play off these three qualities, they will drive productivity. So be humble to know your team's superpower, support your team to remove obstacles, and then coach your team to work efficiently together, show you believe in the superpowers, and encourage people to push their boundaries. So just gonna wrap up with a few more slides. Talking about the fact, so this is how you deliver creative leadership as a service. I hope this is giving you some tips on how you can become a better creative leader. And I know when I talk to people that they are super worried about this title of being a leader. And they feel like they have to act and behave in a specific way. We have the stereotype of an old man in a suit in an office somewhere. But creative leadership can be played out in so many different ways. And for example, when it comes to delivering the uh, positive attitude, it's, you, can play, like, you can deliver that in so many ways. If you're an extrovert, you can do it with loads of energy. If you're an introvert, you can do it in a more subtle way. And that is okay. So it's about staying true to yourself and find your leadership style. It's about understanding what qualities you're good at already, which ones you need to work on, but also about which ones you want to get, be known for. Because I just want to touch upon the fact that even famous leaders were not perfect. And I'm sure you heard this before, but if you read about Steve Jobs, people are saying he was quite arrogant, he was quite a mean spirit. But he was brilliant at being a visionary leader. And he set really inspiring um, goals for his teams. And he made people really excited to want to follow him. And he also, over and over again, I read, demonstrate expertise in product design and marketing, which meant that the team trust to follow him because it felt like he knew what he was talking about. If you look at Thomas Edison, it's not as many books about him talking about what he was bad at, but there was a lot of things talking about what he's brilliant at. And he was so passionate about what he did, and he fully embraced um, 
embrace failure and experimentation. And there's so many quotes out there talking about how he failed 10,000 times before he found this great idea. And he doesn't see failure as something negative. He doesn't see like failure defined him. He saw it as a way to inspire him. And his belief was that out of a lot of ideas come one good idea. Um, and I really like that. I think he has something good there because over his lifetime, he managed to found uh, 200 companies, which is quite impressive. So I want to say some unique people are born to be leaders and they naturally embrace these 10 qualities. But I will say the most important thing to know is that most leaders are made, they're not born, and you can train yourself. Um, decide what kind of leader you want to be, learn by doing, and stay true to yourself. I will say have self-awareness, that will help. If you reflect upon how good you are and you're open to feedback and coaching, you can quite quickly develop. And be open to evolve your, your toolkit, because as a leader, you need to be better at certain soft skills. And use this framework that I shared with you today to guide you, and hopefully you will be great. And that's all for me. Hope it's been helpful.